Chapter 6, Feedback, Reinforcement, and Intrinsic Motivation. Reinforcement is the use of rewards and punishment that increases or decreases the likelihood of a similar response occurring in the future. Motivation is enhanced with motivational techniques to create an environment that fosters pleasure, growth, and mastery. The theories of reinforcement are heavily rooted in the theories of behavior modification and operant conditioning. B.F. Skinner is one of the most widely known and prominent behavioral theorists. He has suggested that teaching, or in our context, coaching, rests on the principles of reinforcement. Skinner suggested that students learn based on an arrangement of reinforcement. He said, students learn without teaching in their natural environment, but teachers arrange special reinforcement that expedites learning, hastens the appearance of behaviors that would otherwise be acquired slowly, or making sure of the appearance of behavior that might otherwise never occur. There are two basic underlying principles of reinforcement. First, if someone experiences success or reward, they will try to mimic or repeat that behavior to receive additional good positive experiences. Secondly, if someone experiences punishment or something unpleasant, they will try not to repeat that behavior. Reinforcement principles are extremely complex. Often the same reinforcer will affect two people differently. People react differently to the same reinforcement. Some people may take an action such as a decreased grade for late work as punishment, while others would look at this as attention and recognition. Individuals may not be able to repeat a desired behavior, especially when that event is unusual. For example, a quarterback who throws six touchdowns in a game. He may receive a lot of positive attention for his achievements. However, when he tries to recreate that behavior, he may throw ill-advised passes, resulting in interceptions, which ultimately end up hurting his team. And lastly, individuals receive different reinforcers in different situations. We need to consider the reinforcements that are available to the individual. Some of these reinforcements may be competing and dependent upon the source. One may outweigh the other in affecting a person. There are positive and negative ways to teach and coach. The positive approach, which are designed by strengthening behaviors by motivating us by rewarding appropriate behavior, which then increases the likelihood of desirable responses occurring in the future. The negative approach attempts to eliminate unwanted behaviors through punishment and or criticism by focusing on punishing undesirable behaviors, which should in theory reduce the inappropriate behaviors. The negative approach focuses on errors and attempts to eliminate unwanted behaviors through punishment and or criticism. Here are some practical applications for negative and positive reinforcement from the beloved Simpsons TV show. The negative reinforcement occurs to punish unwanted behavior. In the top left, Marge, Bart, and Lisa see smoke coming from the kitchen. They likely provided criticism and maybe even some ridicule to point out Homer's errors in his cooking, which then prompts him to throw out all the food, resulting in him rejoining the family instead of cooking. The positive reinforcement focuses on rewarding appropriate behavior. In the top right, Bart is seen studying. This is a novel thing for Bart, I'm sure. He receives a positive grade on his math test and then is rewarded with a gift for the holidays based on this positive behavior. In the world of sports and exercise, some coaches, instructors, and teachers still use threats of punishment as their primary motivation tool. However, a positive approach is recommended with working with athletes and exercisers. So think about yourself. Which do you use? While it's common for coaches and instructors to combine both positive and negative reinforcement and feedback, Sport and exercise psychologists agree that the dominant approach for physical education and sports should be predominantly positive feedback. The Positive Coaching Alliance, which trains youth sport coaches, recommends a ratio of 5 to 1 concerning positive to negative feedback. 
Sports psychologists highly recommend a positive approach to motivation to avoid the potential negative side effects of using punishment as the primary approach. Research has indicated that individuals who play for positive oriented coaches like their teammates better, enjoy their athletic experiences more, like their coaches more, and have greater team cohesion. Reinforcement can take multiple forms, such as approval, positive comments, media press, and rewards to name a few. Rewards should meet the needs of those receiving their rewards. Positive reinforcement should focus on emphasizing the positive aspect of individuals and improving rather than on screwing up. Positive reinforcement serves as a reward for the desired behavior, but also provides the individual with performance feedback. Positive feedback is motivated by correcting misconceptions about performance. We can still do this by looking at game performance statistics or student grades in a course as examples to determine how well people are performing and making adjustments accordingly. Positive feedback is also motivated by creating internal consequences. For example, how well did they perform in relation to others or the standard? This also allows individuals or a coach to put play or performance in perspective in relation to set goals. You probably do this on every exam you have. You look at your grade and then you look at the class average to see where you're at. Rewards can be either extrinsic or intrinsic. Rewards are extrinsic if they come from an external or outside of the individual source, such as from a course or from a coach or a teacher. Other rewards are called intrinsic because they reside within the participant. If an environment is rich in learning, effort and improvement as opposed to competition, outcome, and social comparison, then the participants tend to be more intrinsically motivated. The appropriateness of reinforcement timing and frequency can ensure that rewards are effective. During the initial stages of training or skill development, Desirable responses should be reinforced often, perhaps on an almost continuous schedule. Once someone masters a skill, it is less critical to reinforce positive performance immediately, although it's still essential that the correct behaviors be reinforced at some point during the activity. Choosing the appropriate behaviors to reward is critical. When individuals are learning new skills, they're going to make mistakes. While the individual is learning, it's important to reinforce successful approximations of difficult behaviors. This means that we will need to reward small improvements as the skill is learned. This is called shaping, and it allows people to continue to improve as they get closer and closer to the desired response. We need to reward performance as it's happening. This increases the chances of that behavior being repeated or a new level of skill being reached. Positive reinforcement should be the predominant way to influence behavior, although many professionals argue against the use of punishment or negative reinforcement, it can actually help to control and change negative behaviors. Unfortunately, negative reinforcement or punishment can have certain undesirable side effects that interfere with the intended outcomes. For example, individuals may misinterpret the punishment as attention this may look like a reward to the individual instead of being the punishment as it was intended. Some coaches think that punishment will eliminate an athlete's error. The thought is, if an athlete fears making mistakes, they will try harder not to make them. When coaching, if you are going to use negative reinforcement, be careful to avoid berating or embarrassing athletes while they're performing skills. We also need to make sure not to punish athletes while they're participating. We can use negative reinforcement sparingly, but we need to make sure that the punishment is enforced when it is employed, otherwise it loses its effectiveness. The potential drawbacks of punishment and criticism include arousing fear of failure, reinforcing the unwanted behavior, producing shame, and hindering the learning of skills. So if this is the case, how can some people use lots and lots of negative reinforcement and still be so successful? Bobby Knight's a fantastic example of this. 
Coaches that succeed through the consistent use of negative reinforcements are masters of strategy, teaching, or technical analysis. Likely negative reinforcement is not the only strategy that makes them successful. Typically, these coaches communicate caring for their team. Any negative actions or comments are not taken personally by either the coach or the athletes. There is a professional respect, if you will, that understands that these behaviors only will happen in the context of practice or games. Coaches who employ negative reinforcement strategies successfully frequently have very talented athletes and the coaches themselves are skilled teachers and strategists, which allows their professional abilities to overshadow their negative approach. Intrinsic motivation is important because it resides within the individual. Outside sources such as coaches and teachers cannot directly offer intrinsic rewards. However, they can structure the environment to promote intrinsic motivation. Individuals strive from an inward factor to become more competent and self-determining. Achieving intrinsic motivation is thought to be the ideal motivation resource. However, reaching it varies within the individual and among situations. There are several popular motivational theories which we should know, one of which is the cognitive evaluation theory. This theory focuses on how rewards are perceived. Determining how rewards are perceived is critical in understanding motivational outcomes for individuals. Cognitive evaluation theory is a sub-theory of the more general self-determination theory. Self-determination theory focuses on three basic psychological needs the effectiveness, relatedness, and the autonomy. Under this theory, intrinsic motivation, performance, and cognitive developments are maximized in social contexts, providing the individual opportunities to satisfy these basic needs. Cognitive evaluation theory helps explain the variability in intrinsic motivation. Common athlete perception problems include controlling aspects like their career, informational aspects, usually of their self, success and failure of the individual, and function and significance of the activity. We can create a mastery-oriented climate by manipulating the following environmental conditions. We can use the acronym TARGET to help us remember the factors which can be manipulated. First is the tasks. We can accomplish this by designing learning activities and assignments. To support mastery goals, it is important to include a variety of tasks, making tasks challenging but also needing a purpose. The A stands for authority. We can provide opportunities to develop a sense of personal control and independence. This helps to foster participation and a sense of ownership in the activity. R is for recognition. This includes formal and informal incentives and praise for completion of tasks. This helps to focus the individual on their progress and improvement towards the mastery of skills. G stands for groupings. We can help facilitate mastery by utilizing groupings, which are arrangements utilized in learning environments, allowing students to master content or skills. We can use individual and cooperative learning experiences to help master tasks. E is for evaluation. Methods to assess or monitor learning. We can give opportunities to improve work using constructive criticism and positive reinforcement. And lastly, T is for timing. The time includes the work or the pace of the instruction. This allows the learner to participate in scheduled activities appropriate for the level of their mastery. Flow is a relatively new area of research in sport and exercise psychology. Flow is essentially our normal study state or in other words, our autopilot state of being, which includes our intrinsic motivation levels. Researchers have tried to determine what makes tasks intrinsically motivating. This is a flow model. This chart can be located on page 145 in the text. If an individual knows how to achieve flow, then they will be able to perform optimally with regular frequency. Flow is obtained when both capabilities or skills and challenges are high. If an athlete with less ability is matched against a strong opponent or high challenge, anxiety will result. 
Combining low skills and low challenge results in apathy or relaxation, whereas combining high skills and low challenge results in boredom. The elements of flow have been identified in a variety of performance settings, but have several common factors. The essential elements for the flow state include, there is a balance of challenge and skills. For flow to occur, an individual must believe that they have the skills necessary to successfully meet the physical, technical, and mental challenges faced. Complete absorption in the activity. The participant is so involved in the activity that nothing else seems to matter. Clear goals. Goals are clearly stated so everyone knows exactly what to do. This clarity of intention facilitates concentration and attention. The merging of action and awareness. The individual is aware of their actions, but not of the awareness itself. Total concentration on the task at hand. The focus of attention is clearly on the tasks at hand. Loss of self-consciousness. The ego is completely lost in the activity. A sense of control. The individual is not actively aware of control. Rather, they are simply not worried about the possibility of a lack of control. No goals or rewards external to the activity. The individual participates purely because of the activity itself, without seeking any other reward. The transformation of time. Individuals in flow typically report that time seems to either speed up or slow down dramatically. And lastly, effortless movement. The individual is performing well, but does not spend a lot of time thinking about it or appears to be trying very hard. Flow is often called an autotelic experience. This word is composed of two Greek roots, auto meaning self and telos meaning goal. An autotelic activity is one in which we do for its own sake because the experience is the main goal. So can we control flow? Unfortunately, the answer is no. However, we can increase the probability of flow occurring if we try to maximize preparation for the event. Increasing the skills and having high challenge will facilitate the presence of flow in elite athletes. Flow can be disrupted easily in non-athletes participating in physical activity programs. Internal reinforcement and motivation have a significant impact on flow. In some individuals, competition may inhibit the presence of a flow state. For example, organized physical education courses. There are some individuals who are not motivated to compete with others and therefore they withdraw from the activity. We also see this in the presence of others, such as parents. It is extremely important to understand that factors can disrupt or prevent flow state in individuals as well. The factor cited most often is preventing flow or less than optimal physical preparation, readiness, and environmental or situational conditions. The factors cited most often for disrupting the flow state were environmental and situational influences. Some of the most common factors preventing and disrupting flow in athletes include physical problems and mistakes, inability to maintain focus, negative attitude, and a lack of audience or coach response. You may even find that some of these factors affect you as a student, especially in the online environment. How many of these factors detract from your flow state in a course such as this? So some of the ways that we can increase the facilitation of flow. We can develop positive mental attitudes, positive pre-competition effect, positive competitive effect, appropriate attentional focus, physical readiness, and unity with the team or coach. Additionally, we can include these factors, providing successful experiences, giving rewards based on performance, the use of verbal and nonverbal praise, variety of content and sequence of practice drills, involving participants in decisions, and setting realistic performance goals. So how can you help provide feedback, reinforcement, and intrinsic motivation to others? Be consistent in your actions. Remember, to be successful, the majority of your feedback should be in the form of positive reinforcement. 
If you're going to incorporate punishment, punish the behavior and not the person. And if possible, allow input on punishments. Sometimes this is not possible nor practical, but when it is, include the individual to encourage the sense of ownership of actions. We can make all of this work for us. Choose effective reinforcers for the individual. Make sure you are reinforcing the right behaviors. Make reinforcements dependent on performance of desired behaviors. And lastly, make sure the person understands why they are receiving the positive or negative reinforcement that they are.